What can I say about the Wyatt Earp Motel? This is a good place for a murder. Today I'm going back to New Mexico for the first time in a long time. I can never get enough of cabooses. Is that plural for caboose? Cabooses? Quite a life. Been doing a lot of just swerving in my lane to for tire management. New Mexico. New Mexico. Texas. Land of enchantment. Green chili stew. Remember the Alamo! Okay, so green chili stew, it, it is spicy. Today in summation was just getting completely through the um, grasslands and prairies of middle America. So yet again, uh, an inexpensive motel worked out fine. Um, one thing I noticed in here is they've got like good lighting. There's one switch and the whole room is lit. Most of the cheap hotels I've been in, you know, you turn on the switch by the door and like one tiny desk lamp comes on and then you gotta run around and turn on four other lamps. It's a little thing. I don't know. It's just well lit. You know, there's even like an ironing board and an iron here. These are all things I expect at over $100 a night, like maybe even $150. Um, mattress was awesome. So, I don't know. Don't be afraid of those off-brand motels. Um, I mean, some of them you have to be, but... Even that one I had in Niagara Falls, I had a good night's sleep. Towels were clean. There was no toilet paper. I don't know about that. I mean, I could have asked. I had my own, though. Um, so, this one turned out great. So I honestly... Oh, is this distracting? I honestly don't think... Um, I'm 12 hours, 12 and a half hours from home. I don't think I'm pushing that. It's it's unrealistic. Um, but I'm going to try to get as far west into Arizona as I can and even push like beyond Flagstaff and um, so that my final day is a shorter day and I get home and see my family. Um, my kid's first day of school today for their junior year in high school. I'm missing it, um, but that's okay. It's just a ride to the school. I'll drive them on Friday morning. So um, let me get dressed and let's get out of here. There's a bug. Why is there a bug in here? I don't have any bugs in my tent. Not a single one. So I'm just tying my shoes here this morning and thinking about how Really uh, grateful I am that I made the decision to go with these keen hiking boots and not uh, my adventure riding boots. Uh, I've done a lot of walking on this trip, and my feet have always been comfortable. The arch support in, in these things is amazing. Now, had I been in some sort of catastrophic accident and had a broken ankle right now, maybe I'd be saying something differently. Um, you know, that is worthy of, of note that these aren't motorcycling shoes or boots uh, and they don't offer the kind of protection that they would, but they certainly offer better protection, you know, because of this really hard rubber toe. They're not steel-toed um, and they are quite waterproof, um, not 100%, 
but really good. Uh, what can I say? You know, I'm happy that I chose them. And then when I was really getting rained on, I did have those, uh, you know, over shoe things that, uh, for riding that I put on, which are horrible to walk in and a little slippery at stoplights when you put uh, your feet down on the pavement. I had to be real conscious of having a sure footedness there. But anyways, happy with this decision. Oh, I even missed a cool feature. Check this out. Dimmable. I have never been in a cheap motel. It's not a kind word. An inexpensive hotel. How about a appropriately priced hotel uh, where I can dim the lights? It's a great feature. And I always appreciate these things with all the cameras and computer equipment I have. Hello. Looks like a good day for riding. And you're always up for it, I know. So yeah, Coyote South, thumbs up. I think probably the one thing I appreciated the most is that when you're at this price point, um, typically when you get a non-smoking room, it means they haven't smoked in it like in the last six hours. <laughs> uh, this room really smelled clean. Like seriously, a non-smoking room. Uh, I like that. Does that clean up pretty well? So much cooler out here. That'd be a great epitaph, wouldn't it? Here lies Urban Monk. He cleaned up well. Um, much cooler. I'm assuming, I mean, I'm going to Arizona for God's sakes. I'm assuming it'll be hotter. I am at a higher altitude right now. But uh, let's get going. It's an early start. pre-flight check, um, oil, loop the chain, and then what I did not capture on camera is that I uh, adjusted the chain tension again, so that'd be the second time this trip. I just took literally an eighth, well, somewhere between an eighth and a quarter turn, well, it was probably a quarter turn, on each of the adjusters, and, and that just snugged it up perfect. South, Santa Fe. talk briefly here at this stoplight about what I'm doing to manage this rear tire. You've seen me do the, the swerving in my lane to kind of get on the edges of the tire more. Um, another thing I'm doing is when I'm braking, if I'm not in an emergency situation, I'm putting the emphasis on the front brake. It just dawned on me I'll be able to lane split tomorrow when I enter California filter up to the front. The rest of America, get on it. Don't touch me, baby. No. Just leave me alone. Because the way you treat me, baby, you know that's wrong. I'm leaving. Gonna hit that highway back home. When I took you off the streets, gave you everything that I had. Oh, 
I just pulled over here a second to put on my microphone. I gotta put it in my helmet. I don't have it there all the time. Uh, so I'm gonna get back on the highway here. But there's a lot of uh, history around here I wanted to touch on. So this is New Mexico. And uh, one of the things that you know, happened in this area, I mean, really, where we are right now, rolling uh, not so much rubber <laughs> left. Um, the Spanish conquistadors, you know, Coronado and Cortez, were all over this area. And so there's history here that dates back, at least there's European history here, that dates back to uh, oh the 1600s, which is a pretty long time ago. And of course, there's Native American history that goes even further back than that. But uh, like we saw at Mesa Verde, where there were cliff dwellings that dated back to 400 A.D. But still, you know, to know that this land that we're on right now, which is so much considered America and the United States today, uh, used to be all Spanish. And the other thing that's really noteworthy about New Mexico, uh, you really can't be in New Mexico and not talk about or think about um, the United States in World War II, the top secret Manhattan project that took place in Los Alamos, not far from here, and uh, the Trinity test site where the first nuclear weapon was uh, tested and detonated. So, you know, 1930s, uh, Dr. Enrico Fermi, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name right, uh, split the atom for the first time, you know, nuclear fusion, or fission, excuse me, uh, at the University of Chicago. And the scientific community was aware of this in the 30s, worldwide. Uh, once the Nazis took over in Germany, um, a lot of scientists fled Europe, especially those with uh, Jewish heritage, and, uh, you know, even if you weren't Jewish, it's not like the Germans were uh, really keen on uh, educated people. Well, sorry, not the Germans, the Nazis. It was the Nazis that were the evil bastards. But anyways, um, so Fermi had done nuclear fission, scientists knew about it, World War II begins. Hitler invades Poland, 1939, and uh, Albert Einstein writes a letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt informing him that the capability, you know, the, the theory exists, the possibility exists that a nuclear weapon could be designed and utilized, and uh, FDR puts a program, you know, he, tells the Defen uh, Department of Defense to get on it. And the result of that was the hiring of a um, lead scientist, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, who assembled a team of scientists from all over the world, many of whom were not necessarily real thrilled with how the program went. There was a lot of secrecy. Um, and many of them would not have been happy, uh, were not happy about building a weapon, but at the same time, many of them knew first person to get that weapon would probably, uh, well, that'd be a good thing to be on that side. And uh, the general that was in charge of this was, I believe it was Groves, General Groves, could have been Graves, pretty sure it was Groves, Google it. And uh, he was a tough guy, and he, he really drove the scientists. And they weren't soldiers. He was. You know, many of them felt like they had joined the military, I think. And anywho, they designed uh, two bombs, Fat Man and Little Boy. 
Uh, of course, they designed that test bomb at uh, Trinity. And then uh, FDR passed away, Truman took over, and Truman made the decision that uh, Fat Man and Little Boy should be dropped on uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki, Japan. And you know, the rest is history. Um, it's not something I'm particularly thrilled about as an American that my country's history is, you know, the single country in the world to have dropped nuclear weapons on human beings and killed them. I, I, I'm not thrilled about that, but at the same time, I guess I'm somewhat conscious of the times. You know, I, I believe there probably was a conflict uh, at a government level between what the loss of life would be if you did a conventional uh, invasion of Japan. Um, that's debated. But of course then there was the beginnings of the Cold War already taking place and, and uh, the United States really wanting to show the Soviet Union what we've got. Uh, and, and that really played into the partitioning of Europe after World War II and how that all played out. You know, the big stick. Whoever's got the big stick is going to have the best negotiating power. So anyways, you know, this land around me has got a lot of history in it. New Mexico is a pretty amazing place when you dig into it. information all over. This says 8 a.m. Google says 9 a.m. and the other door says 11 a.m. So I got to give up on this because I got a lot of traveling to do today, uh, which is unfortunate. I really wanted to show you guys more of the experience here, but Old Town's cool. So I found this place called uh, Rio Grande or something, which would be, I mean, it looks like it'll be the next best thing. But interestingly, we've got all these tables over here. This is the status of the dining room right now, and I have been told that it's a 10 to 15 minute wait for a table for one person. Okay. 
This is really typical of New Mexico. There's so many artists. So, you know, just go into any restaurant and it's also pretty much a gallery for an artist and you can buy works of art, you know, in these restaurants. I waited about, well, over 15 minutes uh, and I had the name of the place wrong. It's Range Cafe near Old Town, Albuquerque. Um, and, you know, there's just empty chairs and tables everywhere and I thought, at least they could seat me and you know give me a cup of coffee so I don't know I, I just want to get on the road it's getting hotter it's time to move and and I've lost 15 20 minutes so time to go like this license plate on this Nissan here though Check this out. you don't appreciate not one thing that I do you're always talking about how you and I are through. You take all my money and you take so much pride. And baby, you, darling, I know that you're never satisfied. I'm leaving you, baby. Gonna hit that highway back home. Okay, a little bit of drama here in Gallup, uh, New Mexico. Got gas, and every time I gas up, I'm looking at the tire, and I am now seeing this. So, um, called a couple of shops. There are only two motorcycle shops in Gallup, New Mexico. Neither of them has a tire that will fit my bike. Um, so now I'm, I called Flagstaff, which is the next town 120 miles west of here. Long way to be riding. Uh, I mean, that's two hours on a tire with belts showing. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that. Not loaded the way I am. So, uh, trying to get a hold of this one shop where the guy said call me back and I'll see if I can get you a tire so uh, to be continued Okay, I'm here at uh, Speedway Motorsports, and we're gonna see what we can do. <laughs> Not a lot of options. Nobody's got a tire in town, so it'll fit the V-Strom. Well, let's give it a shot across our fingers. Okay, thanks, Chris. All right, guys, so um, Chris is my savior. And, well, we'll see. I mean, you know, he, uh, he can't work miracles. We're gonna try, and um, we've got a 130 profile in a 8017 the bike takes a 150 70 17 and then that tire is uh you know really a knobby tire it's meant for 60 percent off-road and a little bit of street but i've only got 700 miles to go and this is the only 17 inch tire in gallup it seems for a motorcycle so getting that thing to seat on a wide rim will be the challenge but we're going to try to do it
So this is the tire Chris is going to try to put on for me. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at the width of the bead, you know, from the outside of, of each bead. And it's not that much different from what I'm used to on these 705s when I put them on initially. So, but it is 20 less millimeters in width. Uh, but that's in the profile that n isn't necessarily the the bead width. So uh, I'm I'm hopeful. I don't have a choice. <laughs> buy one of these machines now. <laughs> the last time I checked to try to get, the, to get a motor that were backward. Come on, baby pop, yeah! So Chris has got a great little shop here. And you know, the fact that he was willing to just throw whatever was on his lift off the lift right away for me and work with me on uh, getting some kind of tire on. Look at that Suzuki Bandit, I love that. That's worth uh, putting some time into, I'd say. I mean, I don't know much about engine history, but anywho, really grateful. You're gonna find friends in Gallup, New Mexico. There's a gem. And a wide glide. You know, that's a model you don't see all the time. Okay guys, Chris has saved the day. He is our savior and this trip is gonna to continue today. Um, we didn't have a tire that was the right profile. He had a 130, everything else about it was right and it is pretty much an off-road tire, but we gotta get 700 miles and we're home. So Chris, thank you. If you guys are coming through Interstate 40 or Route 66 and you come through Gallup, New Mexico, you've got to check out uh, Speedway Motorsports in Gallup. Save the day. Chris's service has been out of this world. Uh, eternally grateful, man. Thank you. Thank you.
gonna hit that highway back home so um i'm just thinking about what a godsend chris at speedway motorsports in gallup new mexico was um you know he's a, a small business owner who by the looks of things you know it's not like it's easy um, I'm sure he works pretty damn hard for every penny of it and uh, you know his tire machine had a, a motor that was bad and he had figured out how to use a just a, a rechargeable drill to activate the mechanism and turn it uh, but he really needs a new motor and and controller in his uh, tire machine but you know he took the bike that was on the lift whatever he was working on he pulled it off and made me his priority because uh, I, I wanted to continue with my journey and not spend a night or two or three waiting on a tire to be delivered and he also you know helped me out by given me a tire that's not exactly to spec for my bike but it's working it's going to get me home a lot of shops i think would just say oh no there's risk and uh you know we have fears that this will come back to haunt us legally later he just helped me out and and was a good human being um and so one of the things i wanted to talk about while i was here in Chris's Navajo and while I was in Navajo uh, country but um, was uh, the the Navajo code talkers in World War II many of you probably know the story uh, but some of you maybe do not but during World War II the United States military recruited Navajo uh, soldiers to become code talkers they came up with a code you know that was a jumbling of words but then they also spoke it in their native tongue the Navajo language which in World War II had never been written down there was no record of it anywhere other than uh, in speaking with people and so you know I have to imagine that uh, there were plenty of Navajo people in 1930, 1940s America who still remembered what this country did to their ancestors. And uh, I don't know all the details of bad deals, but it, it seems like the US government made all sorts of bad deals. Uh, and frankly, let's not forget that, you know, the United States was committing genocide on Native peoples back in uh, the 1800s before, long before Adolf came along in the 30s in Europe. So these uh, Navajo people volunteered, they joined up, they went through basic training like every other soldier. And the Japanese military never cracked that code and the US military operated in the Pacific uh, with complete secrecy to their plans always uh, and I think that was a unique case in World War II I think all the other codes of, of just about every other military was figured out during that war certainly the German Enigma machine was cracked at uh, Bletchley Park in uh, Britain and, uh, and I think even Britain's code was cracked by the Germans. But, uh, yeah, I just think that's a great story. And he said there are still some code talkers from the war alive today that show up with, uh, with their uniforms and their special hats that, uh, that they received as code talkers um, at community events that he's been to. So I, I just think that's a great story, and uh, clearly uh, Navajo people have a big, big heart. Chris did help me out. Good guy.
on with the rain gear because I'm headed right into that so I thought I'd just get ahead of it plus the temperature dropped about 15 degrees like somebody flipped a switch so uh, again I'm not gonna bother with the rain boots it's not that much rain and these Keens are somewhat waterproof my socks are not but you know they'll dry out Okay, another long day in the saddle. Um, it was going to be a long day anyways, and then the cords on the tire were showing. And so, again, just, you know, show some love in the comments for Chris at Speedway uh, Motorsports in Gallup, New Mexico. He really didn't have to do that. Um, he could have said, I can get to it tomorrow. Or, no, I'm not going to put on that tire that's not an exact fit for your bike. Uh, we'll have to order something and overnight it or whatever. Um, that was just great of him, you know. And it's working well. I've ridden it another four and a half hours since I was with him. And uh, have I ridden that far? Maybe further. I don't know. Anyways... Um, my trip will come to an end tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, I'm anxious to reunite with my family at home. And I pushed and pushed really uh, long miles today so that uh, tomorrow that will be a shorter ride. And I'll get up and I'll go. So, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was interesting, to say the least. You know, adventures are adventures, 
And like Neil Peart said, adventures suck when you're having them. But they make great stories. Thank you.